Hello everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I've come all the way from the land of Sachin to the land of Sir Don Bradman. And it just feels so amazing to be coming to a place where you can finally talk about cricket. And yes, of course, Ruby. Last time when I was visiting the United States, I had carried along a cricket kit with me in the hope that if enough people show interest, I could teach them about the game and also probably play a few. I mean, how hard would it be since they probably already know about a game called baseball? Turns out, after enough of them did show interest and we explained them all the possible rules and told them that when you hit the ball, you don't actually run to the three bases but you run the other end from where the ball is pitched, everything seemed set and fine. So a friend of mine finally bowls a delivery to this person, he hits it really well, like a T20 slog shot, but then throws away his bat and actually <laughs> runs for the other end. <laughs> okay, so that's about cricket, now let's talk about Ruby. I've come all the way to talk to you about something that was done about seven years ago, yes about legacy code. Not the next best thing on the block, but probably one of the most important things that have happened to the Ruby world. At times, when we log on to Hacker News or look at the GitHub trending repos, we see all these awesome things that people keep churning in day in and day out. And at times, I wonder that as technologists, we tend to always end up playing catch up with the next best thing on the block, but not necessarily spending enough time on going back to the basics and really looking at how are all these things working together, okay? So, Donald Nath, when he stopped using email, actually said that email is for people who want to be at the top of things, but not necessarily for him, since he likes to be at the bottom of things. But I certainly do not need to tell you about this here down under, right? <laughs> Anyways, so today, what we are going to talk about is, I'm going to quickly cover what is Rack, we're going to talk, develop a sample rack application and then refactor that application into something that behaves much more like a framework which everybody knows about, which, is, which will behave in structure very similar to Rails, but will not internally be actually Rails. The structure would look like it, but won't be in behavior. Okay, so let's just begin. When a web server typically gets a request, it converts the request data into an object representation that and hands it over to the application or a framework which then can act upon it. Back in the day, there was no standardized way to do this conversion. So as a framework developer, if I had to support a specific server, I had to write specific handlers for doing that, okay? So Rack came along and solved just this problem. It provided a standardized API or an interface for frameworks and servers frameworks and servers to talk to each other. So what is Rack? Rack though, as I talk, told just now, is not necessarily a web server interface though. It has now evolved into something which is a tool for composing web applications together. And at the same time, it's become a collection of middleware utilities. And we'll soon see why am I saying so. A Rack application looks something like this. It, it, uh, a Rack application is something that responds to call by accepting an argument of hash, which is ENV. It is the request data represented as a hash. And it responds with three things, status code, headers, and the response body, okay? So this is a Rack compliant application. You have 200 as a state HTTP status code, content type text plane as the header info, and hello world as the response body. You write these applications inside a config.ru file. RU stands for rack up and not, it's not a Russian domain, so, so to say, it's rack up, okay? So proc by default responds to call, right? So it becomes a rack compliant application or even a lambda. So you can say something like run proc, env is the request data coming in as a hash and responding with 200 content type and hello from rack up. If you go ahead and actually say rack up, it will boot up on port 9292 and when we send request to that localhost 9292, we'll get a response as hello from Rack app. okay? Typically, the web architecture looks something along these lines, right? When a HTTP request is actually coming in, there are a lot of intermediaries it goes through. Things like a reverse proxy, a caching server, a firewall, 
and then finally arrives at your application. Most of our time is spent working on the application aspects of it. Rack just imitates this architecture style into composing web applications together. So if we in fact zoom in into the app part, this is how actually internally it looks. In the web world, we call them intermediaries, while in the rack space work, we call them as middlewares. So don't get confused when someone is actually talking about a middleware. It's just another piece of layer while developing these applications. To write these applications together, Rack provides us with a mini DSL, okay, which is done with the help of a Rack builder class, which gives us use, run, and map. So here's a sample Rack application. We see Rack builder new. We say use, that is use a specific middleware, use a specific intermediary. Map a specific middleware to a specific path. So here we are mapping logster onto the path slash logster. And when we send that, and we'll see this in action now. So let's do some code. And then I have a directory structure here. I have config.ru. And I have a class called as my rack app. Let's write a rack app which looks or obeys the rack interface. So we have response, we have content headers, and then we write here hello from rack app. Well, we go back to config.ru, we say require my rack app, and then say run my rack app dot new. Okay, then we go to the directory, just say rack app. Rackup is just basically evaluating the code, whatever is inside config.ru. So it's just a tool to actually eval that and actually run the config.ru file. So it's booted up Webrick on port 9292. We go and request 9292 and we have hello from Rackup. So that's working. So this is the simplest Rackup that you can actually write. Okay, let's improve this code a bit to implement to ref so that it looks much better and then we can play around to improving it using the tools that rack gem provides us if we have to actually keep writing headers and response like this it's going to be a pain and we are not going to get too far ahead instead let's make use of a rack response object okay so if i say rack response new and now i just say hello world it's still going to respond the same way instead of and make assumptions and determine what content type needs to go back, what content length header needs to go back and all of that. So we are just wrapping this up into the simplest rack uh, response. We go back to config guru. Uh, if you know, now since we have changed this, we'll have to stop rack up. We'll have to stop the server. I don't want to be keep doing this again and again. So instead what I can do is I can say something like use an existing middleware and just reload the app that is below it every time. So you go back, you say this and then say rack up, it will boot up on 9292, I go back and it is still going to work. But as you see, there is a difference in the way it is looking now because earlier we had specifically written text plane while now rack response makes this text HTML as a content header. So it looks a bit different than the earlier. Now if you go back and change this and since we have user rack reloader, we don't actually have to go and restart this. I can just go and say this and so we have made use of two things here using the DSL. We have made use of the use keyword or the DSL construct and then we have made use of run. So we've, uh, what is the next thing? We would probably want to use a map also from the uh, DSL. So here I require rack lobster, which comes bundled with the rack gem, and then I map slash lobster and do. Then I say run rack lobster dot new, and I just end it. Okay. So now what we are going to have is when the request is coming in, it is going to pass through this layers. First, it is going to rack reloader. Then it is going to come to, if the request is for lobster, it is going to run that piece of code. 
If not, it is going to go and run myracapp.new. So since now we have changed config.ru, we obviously need to stop this. We go back, we say rack up. So this still is working. And now we go to Lobster and we have a Lobster on our screen. So fine, you can flip it and you can crash it. But this page we have never returned anywhere. It's still a good looking output for an error page, right? If you go below, you end up seeing that you're seeing this error because you used rack show exceptions. And never in our middleware stack have we actually returned that. Where is it coming from? It's actually coming from a piece of code in, in the server class of rack. So what's happening is when you actually say rack up, by default, the server is loading in development two middlewares, rack show exceptions and rack lint, okay? So the rack up command itself is making your use of two middlewares at the top of the stack. So that anything that's going through the stack gets bypassed via the rack lint and rack show exceptions, right? So that's the part we had a demo of my rack up. We used the middleware constructs of use, run and map. There's another interesting part. Earlier I talked about using the rack DSL inside a block of rack builder new. But nowhere while writing config.ru, we actually wrote that. We just wrote use, run and map. So what's really happening here? The thing is, when rack up actually evals the code, it does it like this. It does it inside a block of rack builder new by default. So you don't have to keep doing it, okay? So that's how it composes the entire rack application as a piece of stack. So the entire application can be, it in itself becomes a rack application. This is how map works. I'm showing this piece of code because we are going to use this later when we actually implement something similar to just rates. What is map doing? It's doing two things. We saw map slash lobster and a piece of block. So it is maintaining a hash map of the paths and the block that it needs to run against, okay? So dynamically when the request comes in, it can just look it up in the hash map and then run the block associated with that. If you use Rails, you must have at times said rake middleware. If you actually go and do it, I have a sample rack application here. So if I say bundle rack, rake middleware, it's going to show me all the middlewares that Rails by default loads. So if you see, it's using rack runtime, method override, action dispatch, and at the bottom is our routes, okay? So the routes file is at the bottom. So in effect, what is happening is along the lines of this. We have a server, which is in itself composed of middlewares, okay? But applications like rack show exceptions, rack lint that rack up by default loads. Similarly, for the framework side, there are things like I showed you in the Rails rake middleware, right? So it's doing a lot of things and it's coming to routing. Routing it which again, routing it back to dynamic applications, which in themselves are rack applications too. So in effect, when we talk about developing applications, we're actually developing rack middleware. So when we're composing a web application, we're in fact composing layers of pieces of code loosely coupled from each other, which can be inserted at any piece of the stack and then can be reused across, okay? That makes us all full stack developers, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, after learning about the basics of rack, I'm sure this is pretty clear till now. We want to be able to do something of our own. I know, why would you build another framework? Not just because we can, right? But because there are actually some reasons at times that you really need to look at. What I've seen traditionally 
is people tending to fit problems into solutions they know. So if I know Rails, I'll put it that problem and just solve it using Rails, whichever way it takes it. But for certain problems, let's say for if I want to do just an API backend, I don't know, I don't want a monolithic application. I don't want views, the backend all going all together. At times you so people end up using Grape or Sinatra, right? But then Sinatra becomes too simplistic at times. I don't really want to go to a level where that's as simple or I have requirements which don't necessarily fit in. So you end up using Pedrino and then it goes on. Obviously, you know there are at times other reasons for it. Writing controllers is not curdingly, but it's now cruddingly awful. <laughs> it's no longer curdingly awful. There may be other reasons. Fearware. You know what is fearware? It's a term that I had to coin specifically for fear of upgrading to new software. <laughs> so if you have a Rails 2 uh, app already running and you want to upgrade it to Rails 4, it's no longer upgradable. It's no longer an upgrade. It's supporting to an entirely new framework out there, right? At times, certain critical apps don't necessarily have that leverage to be able to do that during every refactor. Maybe the reason is it's just too bloated, or maybe it's just too simple, or maybe the over defaulting nature of a specific framework is not what you want, or you just want to learn about doing it yourself. If you keep end up doing it yourself, your code actual, if you go back to writing your own frameworks, if you go back to writing Rails app, there's certainly going to be a great boost in how you write them. You're under, going to understand frameworks much better internally, okay? So why not do something like just rails.rb? What we are now do is we'll implement pieces of functionality like controllers, routings, views. Models, if we get time, we'll talk about it, but not necessarily in this uh, period. So what I've done is I'm going to be switching between the command line. I've created several branches here to show you how to walk through the code. First, we are going to look at the application branch and we're going to go back and look at the Just Rails app and just Rails RB. So this is exactly similar like the basic Myrac app we had, right? But I've just encapsulated it in, inside a just Rails module, okay? Then I've gone to config.ru and done exactly the same thing. I've said require just Rails and require config application and then j run just Rails app application new. If you go to config application.rb, this is just inheriting from our just Rails framework now, which is very similar to Rails in the way it's looking. If we go here, now say rack up, if you see this is actually spitting back the ENV that we get so that we can take a look at the environment that is getting passed in. So fine, it's bound to happen. Any live coding? Okay, it's already running, that's why. Oh, fine. So the port was already taken. We go back here and we go to localhost 9292 and we have the environment hash, right? So the env.inspect is actually working. So this is the simple, so the first thing we did is basically refactored basic Myrac app into a module. What is the next thing we would want? We would want something very similar to controllers. This was the structure that I manually created. You could obviously write rake tasks to do it, like now Rails does using scaffold, a generate, or new app. I've done this manually, and then just have a just rails.rb. We could obviously extract that into something like a gem, but for demo purposes, I've kept it into a single fine file to showcase you. Controllers do a bit of things. We'll obey the conventions. So the conventions I'm talking about is something like this. When you're actually getting a request for a host products index, you know what ends up happening. The request is actually translated into products controller and index action. While the file it is looking for is actually products controller. Inside the folder, app, application, and controllers, right? How would this end up looking in code? If we go back, 
I'll stop this. I'll just do basic controller. And here's how it looks as a basic implementation. So basically taking in a request, similarly to the response it was earlier, wrapping it up as a request object, then sending it to parse request. What is parse request doing? It's basically stripping the path info into four parts. We are right now making assumptions about the path is going to look, which will change going ahead. But as a first step, we'll make this assumption. We'll run with it. We'll capitalize the controller. So products now become products and we'll just append controllers to it. Fine, we have the controller name. Now I need to be able to load this class. So I say object.const get cont and action which gets returned here. I create a new class, the controller class, and then just send it the method. Whatever response I get, I just respond back in rack response new. Fine. But this object.const get is a piece of Ruby magic. What's happening here is it's trying to load the symbol from the load path. There are two things missing here. First, we, are, we do not have the application right now into the load path. Right? So we need to fix that. Second thing we need to do is it's not going to be able to find products controller directly because it's actually located inside products underscore controller. Right? That's the file we need to require. Okay? So first we need to be able to convert this into an underscore format. So what I've done here is I've copied this piece of code directly from active support. Okay? So this is exactly what Rails is also doing. It's not that we have just hand waving and doing some specific stuff to just get the point across. This actual core from active support, but I don't want to use active support directly. So I've just copied that piece of two underscore. It is obviously doing a lot more things here because it Rails not needs to deal with namespace controllers, which right now we are not worried about. Okay. So what is the missing piece? The missing piece is const missing. When you say object.const get and it is not able to find that file, it ends up calling object missing. So what we do here now is just convert that name products controller into an underscore format. So products controller now become products underscore controller and then we just require that. And then again say const get so that now the class is loaded back. Okay. And where do we add our application to the load file, load path here. Okay, I'm not sure if you see till the end, but it's just looking for the current directory, double dot, a directory above, and then app and controllers. Okay, and if you go to a controller now, inside app, controllers, and products controller, we have this basic first function which is just responding with hello world again. Let's see if this is working as the way we want it to. We go back to saying rack up. We go here, we say products first, and we have hello world. So that means the product, the controller is actually responding to our request. Fine. But what happens if we now go back to root? It's a problem because now we have made assumptions about the controller existing. We'll fix that in a minute. Okay, so we go back here. Just a minute though, I would want to show you a sample Rails application and show you that it's exactly behaving the same way. This is a sample app here. If you go to config.ru, you see it is requiring config environment and running rails.application. If you now go to config application.rv, it's exactly like our just rails application. This is in effect how exactly rails internally is also loading its classes and evaluating the config.ru. Okay. What is another important part for it? So we looked at the auto loading part. So no longer we have to say and everywhere if we add controllers, we no longer have to say require products controller, require home controller, require items controller, any of that. The auto loading part has taken care of it. What is the next part? We want to be able to implement views. 
why not make use of an existing gem to actually facilitate that for us? Why there is no, uh, so writing view on its own would be a different problem to solve altogether. Sinatra itself, in fact, ends up using tilt internally. So that's what Sinatra also uses. So let's leverage that power. Tilt is basically just an interface to several Ruby template engines. How it works is just like this. You say a template tilt.new, pass on a template to it, and then just say template.render. Whatever is in it will be rendered out. Okay? So let's make use of this. Let's write. So we go back here. Okay, I'll just close all of this. Okay, we go back to products controller. Now we want to be able to write something like a render view, which exists inside views products first. Here I have printed out ENV again just to be sure that the ENV is actually getting propagated till the view part. Okay. So what do we change in just rails RB? We go back to our controller class and implement render view. Okay. So render view is now again looking for the app view, is making an assumption that everything is going to reside inside app views directory and while for rails it actually exists inside not just app views but app views the controller name and then all the view files right so we'll just see how we could do that so here i implement a controller name now we have products controller from self class i could convert it to string and then just g sub the controller from the end and remove it but now if it's a camel cased controller like hello world controller the folder name is actually hello underscore world for the views directory so we can reuse our to underscore method back here again and just pass this on here and that's it so now we have a controller name we go back to looking at line 49 template we create till dot new we say render and then we have passed on the locals so we just merge that with env so that now env is propagated back to the view okay now if i actually go and say products controller and let's try passing in a local and then we'll go here and say value of x is and then going back here and saying rack up and going here again and we have it running so that shows that views are running for us yeah another small win for us okay what next the most important thing that happened with rails 3 and going ahead is every controller method was converted into a rack application itself and what advantage does it have it has advantages something like this so in effect in the routes file in rails when you actually say get slash to products index it's actually converting that piece of code into something like get slash to products controller dot action colon index and it can do that because the other end is actually a rack application in itself so every controller method is a valid rack application in our case we do not have that right now what the simplest way to do it is not call send directly on the controller class but instead abstract that out into another function which ends up calling it and wrapping the response back into a rack application or the rack response format of returning three things the status code headers and the body okay so how does that look we stop this here again we just and then we go to methods as rack apps and then we look at the piece of code okay 
So here we no longer directly call class.new and then call send on that action. What we now do is directly call controller class action and then just send the action to it. Okay, what is action doing? It's actually wrapping up the controller inside a piece of proc. Proc being a valid rack application should be able to do it for us. So what we say is proc create a new instance of the controller and dispatch it. Dispatch now ends up calling the controller di method directly and then just wrapping up the response inside a rack application format. Okay. What advantage does this have? Now I can go back to config.ru and say something like this. Right? I can go back to saying map slash products controller dot action index. So going to the root is now going to be a solved problem for us. Right? It will no longer get no controller found for it. Since now we are not relying on that assumptions we made about routing happening a specific way. We are now able to approach routes in a way that makes more sense. Okay? So we go back. We say rack up. We go back here. This still works. Sorry, here. This still works the way, and then we start getting this is root. Right? So if you go to products controller, it's actually index is this is root. So fine. We have rack controller methods now behaving as rack applications. So this is okay. What is the final part of the puzzle? Final part of the puzzle is about implementing your own routing. Okay, you could obviously make use of existing router libraries here, something like an HTTP underscore router, like we did for TILT, but it's actually not that hard to implement a simple routing table, right? Like we saw what Rackup is doing, it is just maintaining a hash map of the routing table with the keys as the paths and the blocks as the value, right? We could do something similar. If we have the HTTP verb as the key and the value as an array, which in itself, if the request is for hello, it knows the block that it needs to call. And if it is for first, it knows the other rack app that it needs to call. So we'll go ahead and do something just this. And it's not that hard. We go here, we say routing. Now, if you go to just config.ru, we have something which is making more sense. So we have something similar to how Rack has now. Rails, routes, draw and do. So here I have done created a new application instance. I have not said run app, now I say it at the end. But first we create the routes that we want. So I say get slash product controller dot action first index. On first we say first on the hello part we route it to hello so that everything is working together. How is draw working now? In the application part, okay, here, it just gets passed on the block of code into the do block, which is now creating an instance of route set dot new and just instance evaluating that piece of block again. Now if I go below, what route set is doing? is when it gets get, it's actually calling define route. What is define route? It's just adding it to the hash map. Okay. So we, while the routes are defined, it has built up the routing table completely. What, when the request comes in, we no longer make assumptions here in the piece of code. What we say instead is now get track application. Okay. Get track app. What does it do? It actually just checks the hash map to see which application needs to be run against it. I go, so we get the rack application that needs to be called associated with that route and then just call it. And that should help us do everything associated with routing. So run routes is just looking at the request method in the env and the path info and trying to match up with the hash map. Okay? Simplest tech. We go back to our favorite rack up. We go and then say 
this is root still works if i go now to hello hello still works and if i go back to first first still works we have just fails implemented almost from scratch with bare minimum autocomplete that i needed to do so that i could show it properly in about i'm sure last 20 minutes how writing this really helps is now you understand rails or any other framework that you end up building upon much better and that time times really this is making to go and make a big impact on how you write other pieces of code any other place what options do we have is this the only option obviously no there are other options is rails itself provides a rails metal interfaces right which are basically direct it's called metal because the request directly go through to the rack okay so you could directly inherit from rails metal or let's say if you wanted to implement something like an api you could directly or if you want are interested only in implementing the controller parts of it you could inherit your classes directly from action controller by including gem uh, active support action controller the, so but do that based on what you need not necessarily always gem rels does work at times there is a need that you need a specific piece of code and you can just uh, include that using modules what other ways uh, so uh, this pattern of rack middleware is really interesting and unfortunately we don't see a lot of it used in our community the only place that i've seen it being used to its power is in vagrant if you have looked at the vagrant code when it actually booting up it has a concept very similar to middleware which has it has been inspired from rack and what it does is while booting up the virtual machine it walks you through a series of middleware why helping the using this really helps in a way because now you know the order of execution of it right it's going to go from top of the stack to the bottom and respond from bottom to the top just like the http or the web framework or the web architecture looks like so this has really a lot of advantages for specific problem sets the references this sinatra rails and thin if you actually walk through the code they are really helpful in actually implementing and understanding and writing your own code and that's pretty much i have for you today thank you Got time for a couple of questions if anybody has one. Here's one over here, John. Oh, okay. So, in fact, uh, if you're interested in implementing something like Thin, you should go look up at my GitHub profile. I have a server called as Chotu. Chotu just means small or tiny in Hindi. Okay. So it is a bare minimum code which just does one work of starting a TCP server on port 4321, listening for the TCP request, and doing eval inside a rack builder new block, and you have your server ready. So even that's not the hard part of it. You should look that up for a very simplistic implementation of a possible rack server. Anyone else have any rack questions? Was, was that too much? Yep. I'll I'll tweet that. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I'll I'll pause this. So we'll get the slides up yeah. um, and get them shared out. Any any thoughts on how you might approach testing, like where you might do controller tests? Yeah. So you could use something like Minitest again. I've tried it out. Uh, I could show you after this. Or there is a rack test middleware in itself, which is specifically geared towards testing basic bare minimum rack applications. So that's again. A lot of useful. Yeah. Would you have to do anything different if you were developing asynchronous uh, or um, asynchronous I/O evented kind of code? Oh yes. So in fact, so at times that part is specifically taken care of at the server side. So in fact, if you look at Chotu. Uh, I have a couple of different implementations there. One uses thread, 
one ends up using cellulite to do poking, the other uses event machine. That's exactly the code that Thin itself uses. So, yeah, evented I.O. or async I.O. definitely can be done on the server side. So the request when it's coming in, it should handle it that way, right? What about like, so if your code wanted to do it inside your, um, you know, your rack application, mm -hmm. um, if you had some middleware, uh, is there something different you have to do? Because you, if you call into a block right. to do something, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't actually complete because it's going to be handing that off, right. how can you like do a before and after in your middleware? So, uh, I'm not really sure, but uh, the first thought that comes to my mind is, uh, if you have a middleware, uh, so it's basically and then just responding to call, right? And you could in fact write sort of stream apps inside of that and that should still work. So there's specifically, if I talk about existing implementations, go look up at Cramp, okay? okay? Yeah, so Cramp does it very similarly and it's not too hard actually in fact to replicate that part of it. Right. So I hope that answers your question. All right, so let's thanks Nishant. It'll be uh, five minutes before the next talk. <laughs>